right, this meeting of the Open Space Commission on Sunday, August 26th, 2024, is called up with order. And I'll start with the roll call. Vice Chair Thomas? Yes. Commissioner North? Present. Commissioner Fox? Commissioner Rundbeck? Commissioner Wallen? Present. Commissioner White? Present. And Council Member Representative Harris? Move on to the uh, land acknowledgement statement. Flagstaff Open Space Commission humbly acknowledges the ancestral homelands of this area's indigenous nations and original stewards. These lands, still inhabited by native descendants, were a mountain sacred to indigenous peoples. We honor them, their legacies, their traditions, and their contribute, continued contributions. We celebrate their past, present, and future generations who will forever know this place is home. Next item on the agenda is the approval of the June 24, 20, 2024 minutes as written. Is there a motion to approve? I think a motion to approve the minutes from June 24, 2024. Mm -hmm. Second. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Motion to adopt the minutes as written carries. At uh, this time, any member of the public may address the commission on any subject that is not scheduled before the commission on this day. The Arizona Open Meeting Law prohibits the commission from discussing or taking action on an item which is not listed on the prepared agenda. Commission members may, however, respond to criticism made by those addressing the commission, ask staff to review a matter, or ask that a matter be placed on the future agenda. To address the commission on an item that is on the agenda, please wait for the chair to call for public comment at the time the item is heard. Are there any members of the public who wish to address the commission at this time, either in person or online? Appear that there are any. So we will move to the business items. And the first item on the agenda is the John Wesley Powell project update. Robert? Yeah, thanks. Our colleagues in community development, Michelle and David, have joined us to provide a couple of updates. Both of these updates went to City Council a few months ago. So if you're interested in hearing that session, you can uh, check out the old videos from that as well. So I'll turn it over to them. Thanks so much for being with us, Michelle. No problem. Thank you, everybody. I'm Michelle McNulty. I'm the planning director for the city of Flagstaff. David Peterson is joining me. He is with Capital Works. He is the project manager on the John Wesley Powell design project. Um, David, are you able to pull up the alignment while I kind of give an overview of where we're at with this project? Perfect. Um, so as um, Robert mentioned, we recently went to council to give them an update. Um, as far as where we are, we are still finalizing the alignment. Um, some of you might remember that council um, originally, this alignment went down the 4th uh, Street corridor. Um, council had given staff direction due to neighbor uh, concerns and input at, about concerns about um, that cutting through their front yards. Um, to look for another alignment. And so this is um, generally what they, they were thinking, this has been truthed up a little bit through looking at topography, um, floodplain, and other issues in the area. Um, we are still in the process of working with the property owners to which the road will now be going through to get consensus on the alignment. I think that we are about there. One of the, the points was around the Gibson property, that one in Brown, um, kind of where it was coming into their property and where it was going out. Um, they um, are one of the owners in the area that don't have development plans. So um, they were really kind of sensitive to where that road went to make sure it left them with use of their property on both sides of the road. Um, also as part of this, so sorry. so. Um, now that we have almost the alignment um, resolved, we have the engineer groups who are representing the various property owners. 
um, including the city's engineer who is kind of overseeing the entire thing, are sitting down and working out some of the intricacies, making sure that all of our data um, points and references are we're using the same um, data. And um, we'll start moving this further into design. Um, we're also still planning on doing the John Wesley Powell specific plan, which was part of this um, part of the tax for this road. Um, it has changed a little bit in scope just because of the timing and where we're at and kind of what we're doing with the regional plan, but it's really going to still focus on um, the activity centers in the area, wildlife um, and trail connections, public facilities. So, you know, confirming whether or not there needs to be a school in this area. We have met with the school district and they had indicated they did not see a need, but we will check back in with them. That's that initial check-in was about two years ago. Um, and then also there needs to be a fire station um, located along this, um, along the corridor. And so the planning efforts will take that into consideration as well. The land use will be, um, is being considered through the regional plan update. Um, and so that process has not really um, picked off yet. Um, we've been compiling information for the specific plan and the consultant team, Swabeck, is currently preparing a schedule um, for what uh, for what that looks like now that we'll be kicking that off in earnest and really meeting with our um, our internal partners as well as other stakeholders, which given the Open Space Commission's interest in this area, especially around the Hoffman Tank and the Hoffman Tank Corridor, um, definitely be bringing you all and pros into that conversation. David, I'm sure I missed something. Could you add anything? Chair and Commission members, David Peterson, Project Manager here in Engineering Division. Uh, Michelle, you did a great job. I think that was a great synopsis. There's a couple things I'll, I'll add in there, but there's not much left to add. Uh, we have been talking with Game and Fish as well, uh, talking about wildlife. We've seen caller data. Uh, and movements in this area as well. So trying to figure out how we can safely, uh, you know, ha apply and build a facility for our community while still keeping an eye and a pulse on the natural environment in this area. So it's fun having those experts on board to be able to help guide us, have the conversation for infrastructure that is going to service that as well. Um, but in the context also being it's private land, uh, we have three different engineers working on the design of this road at this current time. Um, so it is something that we're working on and balancing. We have a brilliant people working on it, uh, a lot of uh, good good team members aboard. So we're uh, excited for a really good outcome on that. I would also mention that we've done a couple of walkthroughs recently. We have had uh, quite a few of the council members out there. We've had staff out there in the recent probably last six weeks. Uh, we've walked this alignment with the designers, with the developers, with the property owners, with the engineers um, to really hone in on, on this yellow line that we've put on, on this map here. Um, this yellow line makes Michelle and I excited because there's been many lines up to this line uh, over the last six years. Uh, so we have probably could have a little bit of tweaking uh, on at least on the horizontal geometry of this road. Uh, but for the most part, it's going to look pretty similar to what you see on the screen here. Uh, and I think that that is exciting for us because we've been working a whole lot like Michelle had er mentioned before, you know, the old alignment going down uh, here on the right through the old fourth street uh, had a handful of uh, kind of fatal flaws, we'll call them, for going in that route. And it's excited now to have a, a new alignment that works, uh, still have logistics going through, and people are constantly asking if we have an update on the project. And it's it's moving slow, but it's moving forward. Uh, so it, it's exciting to see that we're making progress. A lot of moving pieces on this. Uh, excited to have uh, open space on board with the corridor here and hoping we can, you know, realign trails in this area and also pass wildlife. Uh, and pedestrian and bicyclists through this area as well. And um, yeah, it's exciting in that. And I can leave it at that so that we have time for questions. Um, but Michelle nailed it. I think her update was great. And I appreciate Michelle and the team. And I thank you, Robert and Martin as well. I know they're here, but they're also great team members with us working on this very complex, very multi-year uh, project that uh, is moving forward. And I'll just throw out there, there is a project website 
I still need to update it. So my apologies on that. We were in front of council. There is a video uh, back in April, I think that we gave an update on the project as well. Uh, there has been some updates since then, but it has a really good basis on where the project stands today. But on that, I think I will uh, wrap up. Thank you so much. Um, can I ask a question? Hi. The, um, this is Commissioner Thomas, and um, I just wanted to I, um, say that this is one of the areas that the Open Space Commission a long, long time ago identified. I mean, this commission did it a few years ago when I was on last time, but also a long time ago is an area that doesn't have really great access. It actually doesn't have any sort of um, it's an area that just doesn't have great what you would say open space access or open space view sheds or so when you were talking about the wildlife uh, corridors i was pleased to hear that but you pointed over to the gibson area and you talked about the hoffman tank i'm just wondering if you could expand a little bit on what you already have planned or you yeah already commissioner yeah. thomas thank thank you for the uh, I appreciate the, the question and yes, there has been discussions on, on Hoffman tank and how it's uh, obviously it's. Yeah, uh, importance to the wildlife in the area, and I think that not only are we balancing it from a wildlife perspective, but also from a hydraulic perspective as well. Uh, this area has a lot going on as far as roadway geometry. There is a, a drainage here coming in from the east off this NAU parcel or the ABOR parcel, and then this also Comes, drainage comes down here off of Pine Canyon Wash. Can you see my hand on the screen? Yes, yes. Okay, so the, this drainage comes in here and Hoffman Tank actually doesn't hold water, maybe with the exception of very large events. Uh, we have multiple members of our team that have recreated in this area for over 25 years uh, and, and have never seen water in it. So uh, and that's also indicated of, indicative of the vegetation that grows in that tank as well. It's not a, a water based vegetation that's growing in there, but I don't want to belittle the importance of Hoffman tank. It is uh, a route that wildlife uses here based on the, some of the data we've seen, and we're working with the engineers and the biologists and the specialists uh, to be able to make a safe environment. So uh, if the roadway is going to be adjacent to that, if it's relocating a tank or doing something where we're not encouraging wildlife to congregate, immediately adjacent to a roadway. So we're, we'll make it, ideally, we're going to make it successful hydro, hydraulically as well as biologically as well. And, and is there like a plan to, to expand the foot's trail this way or to provide, you know, pedestrian, bicycle, other types of access along this corridor? Yes, Commissioner and Martin, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we have, we will have, on one side, which I believe is going to be on the east or the south side, we're going to have a foots trail. And then on the west side or on the north side of the road, depending on where you are, there will be at least, a, I believe, a five or six foot, maybe 10 foot sidewalk as well. So there'll be there'll be sidewalks on both sides. One will be designated a foots trail. Uh, and then that trail, we're still in the discussion phase of where that's going to peel off. And it's going to probably be a co-joined Arizona Trail in this section and then hopefully go up somewhere up this drainage to tie into the existing Arizona Trail as well. So somewhere in this region here, we're hoping for either an underpass or some, again, we don't know the structure engineering wise that's going to go across this area in floodplain, but somehow there's going to be a crossing here that's going to allow pedestrians, uh, bicyclists and wildlife to go under this area in this floodplain so that your trail is going to hook back and then there'll be a Martin, I don't want to totally botch this, but I believe there's another foots trail that connects going to the north as well. But Martin, could you elaborate on that? Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks. Thanks, David. Um, yes, uh, Commissioner Thomas, we're um, we're planning on on this area being um, access to the forest for both these future communities as well as existing parts of town. Uh, they could access out to the National Forest, which is the gray area just south of um, what's shown in this map. So every, everything south of what, what the properties that you see here are, are National Forest. And in fact, there's a couple of trails that come very close, including the Loop Trail, yeah, down down in that area. 
that we make a connection to. And then, of course, the big point of connection is the Arizona Trail, which goes through this area currently, uh, which could potentially get realigned, but we need to make sure that that is a continuous uh, route as well. So three things happening with trails. One is we're giving uh, kind of commuter access to these neighborhoods, future neighborhoods. Two is we're providing points of connectivity for future and existing neighborhoods out to the forest. And then three, we're making sure that the Arizona Trail is connected through here. Hope that helps. Yeah, and um, Robert, I just want to tell the commission that Robert told me that in um, there's about a million dollars that's still from the 2004 bond that's for like foots and open space. And it might be, this might be the kind of project that we should, you know, really make sure that there's, that the foots open space sort of combination can happen and that money could be used for something like this where we're, you know, if, if we can make it open space and not just a, a sidewalk right next to a, a road, but something different than that. I mean, not that that isn't a good plan, um, but, you know, to start with, but um, yeah, I think open space would just like to, to, this area was identified as a place that didn't have a lot of, you know, the way it is right now, it's got some user trails, but when it gets developed, it's going to be a totally different place. And it's, we, we're just trying to be proactive instead of reactive the way we are in other parts of the city currently. So thank you for your time. And Mary Norton has her hand up. Thanks, everybody. Um, I have a couple questions. And um, so the first one I just wanted to kind of clarify. So we're kind of referring to this as a strategic plan again. I just wondered if it was back to being that more robust strategic plan. I had you know been following this through council presentations as well as P and Z presentations, and you know had been referred to sort of as a specific plan light, and then Sarah Dector referred to it as more of a uh, section uh, sector plan um, that you know was really more of a development guide and not as much emphasis on all the infrastructure needs. So I would kind of wanted some clarification if we're back to that really robust specific plan that encompasses everything that we'd want to see in in this area that's my first question um so mary if i understood your question you're kind of asking like what is the kind of what is the, the plan for the specific plan well is it is it back to a full scope specific plan no, it's still kind of a specific plan light. Um, so I, for just for those that don't know the history of the specific plan, um, I think it was funded maybe about four and a half years ago. I got here about two and a half years ago and it was two years in the books um, due to staffing levels and COVID and a myriad of other things that didn't get kicked off. And at the same time, we had um, we were getting closer and closer to the regional plan update. And that was one of the reasons why it was identified that we kind of needed this specific plan was to kind of bridge. At the time that the um, initiative went to the voters, we were still several years out before we were going to do the regional plan update. Now we're in the process of the regional plan update and we're much further along with that. And so um, great question because it's something that we've grappled with over the last couple of years of what do we call it, but it really will be kind of a specific plan light. I mean, it's going to be a specific plan. It's still going to function like a specific plan. It just won't have um, all of the things that we would maybe originally thought it would include specifically like the land use because that's going to be addressed in the, the regional plan. Um, transportation is kind of being addressed through the different developments through this roadway, um, the different developments are doing tra traffic impact analysis, which are kind of telling us what the road ne network needs to look like. So that information will get incorporated into it, but really the big topics that will be um, in the plan that will be going out for public input will be um, the trails, the trail connections, the corridor for the wildlife, um, the public facilities, so school, fire, and then if there's any other public facilities needed to support this area, um, and then the activity centers. So if, if everybody recalls the regional plan, I think had seven or eight activity centers for this area, which is way too many for an area like this to support. So 
part of this process is also refining what that looks like and having it be a more manageable amount um, of activity centers to really support the, the growth patterns um, and what we're seeing. So, um, but as far as, so maybe another point to clarify, Mary, is that, or Commissioner Morton, is that it's light in the sense of like the topics being covered, but it's not light in the process being followed. It will still follow the code requirement of the various public outreaches, doing a full vetting through, you know, um, interested parties as well as commissioners, going through um, planning and zoning all the way through council. So none of that is being changed. It's really just light in the sense that it's going to focus on a few less things than I think originally intended because those things are being um, handled through a different process. So but they will all process, have to, Yeah, is it the regional plan? Is, yeah. is that so this the, a full specific plan was a bridge until we got to a regional plan. Now we're closer to a regional plan. So some of those details become in the regional plan. Okay, that that does that makes more sense. Um, uh, I'm glad to I'm glad to hear that. And, and I wanted to tag on to um, Jackie's comments about you know obviously open space and the foot connectivity and um, you know because what I've seen is like we have two sets of documents that kind of support this area to have that connectivity. You know we have our our open space strategic planning map, but then there's also that those identified areas from that that bond um, money. And so it sounds like those documents are being relied on, I guess, to uh, as as foot trails and open spaces considered, because um, you know, obviously there were large buffers, sort of speak, sort of speak on those washes to the Rio de Flag and the Pine Canyon wash and all that. So I was glad to hear those things mentioned and, and I just hope they, they remain in the forefront. But as we have, um, as this moves forward, and even though some of the things are covered in the regional plan, which will, is still in the works, obviously your work on this end is still in the works, but yet there is a development that's part of all that, you know, that's on, the development status report it hasn't come before us on in pnz yet but it's on the development status report for the pine canyon expansion in that lower portion of the symmetries of 405 acres and and i noticed that little odd 126 acres that they're working on calling it the pine canyon expansion it seems to align with this road and going through you know the hoffman tank area so I just wondered what becomes the guiding documents if they're not officially in place for a development that's already moving ahead through the development department. So currently um, it's what's in place. So it's the existing regional plan and it's existing um, zoning code is what's going to, to regulate or guide that development. Um, unfortunately, we do not have um, legally, we cannot ask them to not submit applications um, in, in the meantime. So we have to accept those, we have to review them. And what is adopted today is the guiding documents that will um, dictate their approval. I mean, a plat really is, the findings really are, does this meet zoning code? Um, and so it's it, it would be hard to deny that plat without this being in effect anyway. Um, that being said, we're fairly comfortable with that location and the 126 acres um, you can't see it on this map that's provided, um, but so the property that Mayor, Commissioner Norton um, is referencing is the one in purple, it's a symmetry co um, company's 405 acres. And so they don't technically own the entire 405 acres. They have purchased the right basically to purchase the entire site through a series of three different takedowns. And the first takedown is that 106 acres that um, Commissioner Norton is referencing. And so that's what they're platting out. And um, essentially they're gonna plat that and I suspect it's a financing mechanism. Then they'll, once they sell those homes, they'll do the rest of the takedowns. They have until 2027 to take down the other two. Um, but that being said, we're fairly comfortable with the alignment as it goes through um, their property um, and then gets up into the Gibson property. And so they'll be platting it with that um, 
with that plaque. I don't know if I answered your question. I gave you no, a little No, no, you, you did. Um, I, I guess I, I'm, I'm still somewhat alarmed <laughs> by it to not have some of uh, the guiding documents that we would want on this corridor while, you know, while this is moving ahead. But nonetheless, I just wanted to to find out how that how that's working and at what point, you know, really can we have some say in um, how it's how it's being developed along the way. But thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Um, yeah. Um, Jackie and Mary have asked or addressed or broached a number of the questions that I had. Uh, and I have a couple of little bullet point questions. What's the total acreage? All the colored things put together. Probably that. David, you're on mute. I suppose that would help. Thank you, Michelle. Commissioner, it's just under 2,200 acres. I think it's like 2,186, somewhere around there. But keep in mind, it's a very topographical rich area, as you can see by the hill shade behind here. So the vast majority of developable land is far less than that 2,200 acre figure. And then uh, Martin said that the city limits where the line went below there, uh, the bottom line there, the south, is, is that really so, or uh, does that mean that the current Powell Boulevard goes from fire service land, or, or is that just a rough comment? in that area. I was just wondering where the sub limits, city limits are. Com Commissioner, the road falls in entirety in city limits. Uh, I will point out that the two green islands here flanking the old, uh, the fourth street alignment, this island here and this island here, those are county parcels, uh, but everything that's colored on this map is within city limits, minus the county parcel I just pointed out. What so the, this? City, this, the city limits are be below this line here. And is it significantly below or? It, it, what was the second question? My apologies. Can it be below or who owns that land below that? Yes, that's Forest Service below that. So to the south or the bottom of this map. Down here, and then I believe it's more state land off here to the east. Oh. But it is Forest Service land to the south. I want to put it belabored. I don't know whether that line there at the bottom is the city limits or the city limits is below that limit somewhere. I believe that is the city limit, but I'm not 100% uh, sure. Okay, well, it's not terribly important. Uh, from uh, a commissioner's point of view, this is not white, I didn't say my name. Uh, regional plan always talks about, has been talking about the last regional plan and this one activity centers and they are being considered on top of something that is less planned than this is. Uh, my point is I would like, I think it's wise to consider the trails and open space is also at a level of activity centers because they're all connected. Uh, if you have an activity center, you certainly want to have a uh, pedestrian bike uh, ways radiating from those activity centers to the growth areas. You also want to have them connecting any of the open spaces, and now open spaces covers all kinds of uh, things, not necessarily the ones that are under our purview but there's open space for uh, developments, private open space and that kind of open space and all those kinds of open spaces. It seems to me that along with activity centers, you have to have kind of a general plan of not just connecting one foot system to another foot system and not just connecting a foot system, a foot trail to the fire service below. Uh, it should be raised to a, a level. And the reason I say that is from history. Uh, since 1988, and Martin knows this as well as anybody, 
we've been playing catch up on the foot trails systems. So always catch up, always catch up. Can we work this in here? Can we work that in there? Uh, there's an opportunity to have it all as best we can as part of a specific plan, and not just a single trail connected and say, oh, we've done it, or as Jackie says, a, a, a paved trail, a paved road a pathway along the road. Those are all good, but that's not that's not what makes Flagstaff Flagstaff. Um, so I'm just trying to point out in the plan, trails and open spaces should be at a level of activity centers at least. Because it benefits everybody in the long run. It benefits developers because they got an idea what they could adjust to. It, it, it will benefit generations afterwards. Um, I'm just throwing it out. But I will finish by saying kudos because at least you mentioned all the important things as far as uh, what you're looking at is uh, ways for animals, the pathways for the animals. Uh, you're considering open space, you're considering trails, you're considering the whole picture. And I, I really appreciate that. I'm just talking about maybe raising it to a higher level. I'm done. Commissioner, I just pulled up in GIS. I was wanted to add on that the the city limit boundary is actually a diagonal. It's about a mile and a third south of here, so it's it is down in the Forest Service property, well south of this project. So it is not. I apologize, I was wrong. It was not the southern boundary of this map. It's from much further south. Well, that that's good to know because Forest Service land that's within the city boundary is uh, up to grabs for one thing, but it's also up for Our service trails and other things that, that uh, so it's good. Thank you. Of course. Any other questions from the commission? Uh, I've got one uh, quick one. Can you remind me the is the road two lanes, four lanes, and then if it's different than the existing JW PAL, how will that impact that feeder? When it comes into that existing road. Yes, Commissioner, I can I can take that question. Uh, it, it will be built uh, initially as a two lane road. However, our ideal way of construction is to go from the outside in. So we'll take the requested right away. It's approximately about a hundred foot cross section. Uh, we'll build the outside lanes, have a larger median for the time being, and if the time ever comes that it needs to become four lane, we have that capacity to infill rather than expand the road in the future, which is much more costly uh, and much more impactful, especially down the road. But uh, all indications are right now, it'll be a two lane road uh, for a while. So it's it's gonna start as a two lane road with some turn lanes here and there as necessary as development uh, comes along, but it will be a two lane road with your uh, foots trail on one side and a sidewalk on the other side. Is, is that, based on projection traffic or is that a budgetary constraint or just what's like the reason it's, for that? Commissioner, it's been modeled by uh, David Wessel and our Metro plan partners and here in the transportation of the city as well. And it just is not shown to have a need for a four lane road, uh, especially initially. And then that's also been the feedback that we've had at open houses that we've hel held. Uh, to not have as big of a roadway coming through this area has been a desire that's been shared multiple times. So it, it's it's kind of a, a multitude of answers on that one. Uh, it certainly does help with the financial aspect of the roadway as well. Uh, we will have infrastructure under under here as well. So we'll have water and sewer either under the road or adjacent to the roadway as well, in addition to the road. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a myriad of reasons why it's going to be two lane, but that's the, again, going back to wanting to serve the community to the best, uh, the two lane road was the best solution at this time. And it was modeled. Thank you. Uh, are there any members of the public that wish to make a comment on this? All right, well, thank you very much for taking the time to, uh, to brief us and keep us up to date. Uh, appreciate the work on this. Thank you for your time, commissioners. Anything else from staff on this? 
Um, just a reminder, I should think um, that we, this is included 2004 bond funds, like, as Pete mentioned, and that this commission voted to reserve like some of those funds for this priority, this being a, uh, the top priority for the 2004 bond fund that we have remaining to provide that connection to the existing trail, the existing this trail near the Eichel wetlands down into the Forest Service, as Martin mentioned also. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Great. The next item on the agenda is the land availability and suitability study and code analysis project, uh, potentially referred to as last cap. I'm reading this correctly. Uh, update and discussion. So, Robert, turn it over to you. Yeah, um, thanks again for. Um, Michelle did for being here. This item also went to uh, City Council, and we thought this would be something of interest to the community. So, providing us something. Thanks so much. Okay. Um, I am just trying to get this into present mode. So, give me a second, please. I'm going to share my screen. So I tried to um, boil this down to the smallest presentation that I could. Um, and so it's down to about 20 slides. Um, but I have a lot of other slides if there's any questions. And I think Robert prepared a lot of material to give you the background. So um, just an update on the last cap, the land availability and suitability study and code analysis project. Um, this is a multi-pronged initiative to address long-term planning and resilience needs. It's a partnership between planning, housing, sustainability, and mountain line. It's highly um, coordinated with various uh, divisions and sections throughout the city, including engineering, specifically development engineering and transportation, fire, building safety, economic vitality, water services, pros, and others. And it provides a much-needed base and context for recommending code and policy changes. So the scope of the work is the land availability and suitability. So what land is available in Flagstaff and what is the development potential and barriers? And then um, the second part is a in-depth and in development um, code and process analysis. And when I say development code, that's anything that touches development, not just zoning code. So building fire standards, um, engineering standards, um, in, in addition to subdivision standards and our um, zoning code um, through the lens of city council commitments to address housing and climate. Um, and it's analysis of what's working and what's not. And I want to put the emphasis on what's working because we have a lot of things in our code that does work, that do work, and we don't want to throw that out. We really want to just fix the things that aren't working, but we don't want to tinker with the things that are working. So the project boundary um, essentially included the MPO or the Metropolitan Planning Area. Um, so a little bit outside of our um, Flagstaff City boundary and a little bit outside of our urban growth boundary, but really looking at corridors where within the regional plan, there's identified activity centers and a potential for higher density development to support um, the activity, rural activity centers. So we did include those areas. Um, it was high level, kind of the, the process was looking at appropriately zoned properties in the study area, inventorying what was vacant and underutilized. So underutilized was a site that was developed, but the development on the site, the value of the development on site was 10% or less of the value of the land. Um, and then from the inventory, identifying opportunity sites. And so opportunity sites were sites that we looked at the readiness. Um, from like a zoning standpoint, do they already have the zoning they would need to bring in a high density residential development? Um, and then also through the infrastructure lens, does this already serve, is this already served by water, sewer? Um, does it have the appropriate, the rights way um, developed? So this is kind of the, the global map of Ident the identification of those lands, um, purple is underutilized, the green is vacant, and then 
uh, the gray areas kind of show where we have the majority of our environmental constraints. I believe that Robert uh, provided a link to these studies. If you go into the actual study, this map is broken out into a series of maps so you can see it with more clarity. So the general conclusions are we have about 8,125 acres of vacant land spread throughout about 2,242 parcels. Of these, about 6,735 are residentially zoned. Um, and then from a the underutilized land standpoint, we have about 5,400 uh, acres through 1,800 uh, parcels. Um, looking at environmental constraints, and when I say environmental constraints, those are constraints that we regulate through zoning code or through some other mechanism. Um, and so 13% um, of the vacant land within the study area is environmentally constrained by either stream corridors, wetlands, steep slopes, um, and floodplain or floodways. So these lands may not be conducive to development or redevelopment, um, especially for housing. Um, what this did not include, because it's a lot harder to do by a map, is our tree resources, which could reduce the um, billable land by up to 50%. Um, and so just billable land, we end up with about 7,000 acres of vacant and 4,800 acres of underutilized. Um, and these are really the lands that would be most likely developed or redeveloped in the future. So where is the, the billable lands and really looking at kind of the zoning districts that encompass the most? The most of it is actually in our RR, Rural Residential, and ER, State Residential Zoning Districts. Those zoning designations have a one unit per acre density maximum. Um, so what that means is that in order for those properties to really bring in a yield um, of a housing stack, they're going to need to be upzoned. Um, and then we have a lot of um, our acreage in R1 or single family residential, and then manufactured housing, uh, medium density, high um, density residential, and then some of our commercial zone, zones, you can kind of see that break out. So through there, um, kind of identifying where our, our um, vacant spots are, we work to identify about 50 opportunity sites for closer study. Um, this was done through a series of different iterate, um, iterations. One was just um, an interactive comment map, so kind of following what, what has the right zone, what's ripe for redevelopment because of its um, because of the improvements on the site and that value uh, related to its land value. Uh, did an interactive comment map with multiple city divisions to really understand different challenges that they knew that you know are harder to see just looking at a map. Um, and then our consultant team did a series of site visits. We also uh, recommended inclusion of sites from um, the 2023 Downtown uh, Flagstaff Vision and Action Plan, which identified several catalytic sites. The trust land, um, that's where a majority of our um, lands are, and our vacant lands are, and they're in that RR or ER zoning designations. We also looked at Forest Service administrative sites very clearly not forest service lands, but just the administrative sites. There was a recent farm bill um, that allows for the forest service to work with local government and provide workforce housing um, on those sites. And so we wanted to explore that. Um, as of right now, that I think that farm bill is set to expire in September. And it's I believe they're trying to get it renewed, but it's not clear. So we're not sure where that landed. And then um, redevelopment of existing public housing sites the city owns. So this is um, the, the graphic on your, the map on your right, I'm sorry, the one on the left is big picture where kind of the, all the opportunity sites kind of rose up. And then um, the one to the right shows kind of the downtown, the one in the, um, there, anything shaded in blue are potential opportunity sites. The ones that are outlined in red correspond to the ones that were identified as catalytic sites in the 
um, downtown action and vision plan. So just kind of a synopsis of this, the city um, of all of our opportunity site characteristics, the city owns 11 of the sites, almost 80 acres. The county has four sites. National Forest had four. State Trust had five, but a total of 2,100 acres. So you can see where, where a lot of that is in our state land um, holdings. And then 32 sites um, were in private or other holdings and um, for about 365 acres. So current development or land use, so we had four sites that were um, pretty much developed, um, including, you know, different, you know, whether it be um, a development, like a, an old structure that maybe wasn't 10% of the value, could include surface parking, and then just um, 20 were entirely undeveloped. So kind of a split between what would be redevelopment versus undeveloped. 36 of the sites were zoned commercial and 30 were um, public facility, public lands for 30 acres, two sites, sorry. And then here's the breakdown by, um, by density. And again, you can just really see a lot of the, the highest um, yield of available land is really in that rural or state residential zoning designation. So really what this tells us is that a majority of the land that we need to bring our housing online needs to be rezoned and that we have a lot of missing infrastructure to those, um, to those properties. And then downtown specific, we're dealing with aging infrastructure. We have the floodplain and drainage issues. However, um, the Rio de Flag and the downtown mile, all the projects associated with that will likely be an opportunity to bring a lot of those properties out of the floodplain, which could open up other development potential. Um, you have the proximity to the railroad noise, which isn't a deal killer, but when you're talking about certain types of federal funding that can have an impact on um, how you need to mitigate that housing um, to, to meet those funding requirements, which can add a, a significant amount of cost and then access and parking. So now we start to frame this in the context of the regional plan and where did we where did it really call for and when I talk about the regional plan I'm talking about our existing regional plan um, and where um, does it call for new housing um, and so you can see that it's our kind of our older established neighborhoods that are um, zoned commercial and or medium residential and um, high density residential um, so that tells us that we need to make sure that those zoning districts will allow for um, for redevelopment. But the redevelopment has to be um, kind of balanced with new development. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the next slide that I'll talk about a little bit more with um, helping slow down and mitigating gentrification and misplacement. Um, but you can see where we have to look at some of our other areas um, that are not necessarily already developed to provide some of this housing. And so, again, those lands are going to be the ones that are zoned rural residential and state residential. Um, so we need to look at our rezoning process and our subdivision process to make sure that it's keeping up with housing needs, but that it's still um, that we're not losing out on um, meeting our other community goals and needs as well. So as part of all of this, we, you know, we want to make sure that we're considering what we know is a problem in our community with displacement and um, gentrification. And so we had our consultant team look at this and really looking um, using a combination of factors for vulnerability of displacement, really looking at where are we already seeing it in our community. Um, and really, we want to make sure that um, that helps us understand that, you know, we need to bring housing on everywhere. I mean, we, housing production helps offset displacement. Um, and so we need it both inside of our vulnerable neighborhoods, um, redevelopment, and then we need it outside of our uh, vulnerable neighborhoods, whether that be in other neighborhoods that can help absorb infill and densification, but then also opening up greenfield areas. <clears throat> um, this is just kind of more um, more specifics on the zoning and how it relates to those different stages of, of displacement. 
So the um, further analysis with the last is that it's helping inform, it helped inform the regional plan where um, it's provided a lot of input into the scenario planning, um, helping inform land use designations and other changes that could positive, positively impact housing yield while moving closer to sustainability goals. Now, a lot of times those sustainability goals, you know, also are um, open space goals and that connectivity and, and walkable neighborhoods. And so we don't want to lose sight of the connect connection there. Um, it's also informing the code analysis by informing recommended um, zoning code or development review process changes that really impact the density allowed in different zoning districts. And also when water sewer impact or a WISA or a traffic impact analysis, a TIA, are required. It also underscores the importance of looking at um, parking strategies such as traffic demand management to promote residential density, as well as hopefully informing the capital improvement plan um, and underscores the importance of the regional plan and the capital improvement plan working together. So the, um, I'm going to pause here and just give you a little more detail on the CAP or the code analysis project. It's a three-part project. So the first project, first part was just doing a code diagnostic. And what that did is it looked at all the codes that touched development and really started to understand where in those codes we have barriers to achieving density and climate goals. Um, the second phase will be developing code concepts. And that will be kind of a series of different um, suggestions that could be to help overcome those barriers, policy changes that might be necessary to talk about. And then that will be shopped throughout um, the, the citywide organizations, all of our partners, as well as various boards and commissions to kind of understand are these concepts, like do we have buy-in as a community to move forward with these? Or um, should the consultant not waste time any further with that? Or is there something that we hadn't thought about that we do need to, to think about? And then the third uh, kind of phase, and, and really I should say that that second is really focused on the building side and um, zoning, but definitely we're doing a lot with best practices on engineering standards, especially as they relate to roadways. The third um, and final kind of part of the cap is then taking where we've landed with those code concepts and going further with code recommendations. I want to be clear that this project does not change code. It's giving staff an ability to um, basically prioritize a workload of a series of code changes that we would make. And those code changes would go through our typical process um, of public outreach, going to planning and zoning, and then ultimately going to council to approve. So I just want to be clear that this, this project is not making code change, it's only informing code change. So as part of that diagnostic, which is the part we're in, uh, what we really found out is citywide issues are our review procedures, really with zoning map amendments and subdivision review process. Um, they are deterring development and slowing down the pace of housing production. So we need to, again, how do we balance that so that those processes keep up with development, but also that we don't want to lose um, the opportunity that we have within those processes to make sure that we retain certain community values and goals. Um, it's also looked at our affordable housing and our sustainable building incentives. And what it found is that neither of our incentive programs are really economically compelling and it's undercut by other provisions and code. So what that means is that there's other things in code that get you the density bonus and get you um, essentially the same things that these incentives are trying to get you. And so they, you don't need to take that incentive. One of the things we found, for instance, is that other things in our code actually prevent um, in certain zoning districts, specifically R1, the ability to even meet the minimum zoning require or the maximum zoning requirement. I'm sorry, maximum density requirement. So if you already can't meet your density and max out, then you're not going to need that incentive to get more density. And so we need to look at these incentives to figure out how do they work better um, so people are using them. Um, resource protection, it's not optimized to balance the housing production goals with environmental goals. 
we're not saying get rid of the resource protection overlay. We're just saying maybe reconsider how we're applying it to development so that it's actually achieving um, the intent of what it was meant to. Um, and then minimum parking requirements is also a, a critical barrier to housing affordability and development afford, uh, feasibility, as well as climate goals for higher density housing in transit served areas. And then our high occupancy housing, um, it requires a conditional use permit and other specific development standards, um, which are a critical barrier to high density housing. <clears throat> and then it's determined that we had just some issues in zone specific ish areas. Um, so our R1 and R1N, um, low density and restriction and housing types are inconsistent with our housing and climate goals. Um, our medium residential or medium density um, is needs a higher density allowance um, to encourage smaller, more affordable units. And then our commercial zone um, could provide for higher densities that support our goals, but looking at the parking requirements in HOH or the high occupancy housing regulations um, limit that potential. So this is an outdated um, slide, but it kind of just helps un understand kind of the process. So um, for just the last and the code diagnostic portion of the code analysis project, um, we do have an internal internal steering committee, um, both for the land availability and suitability group and code analysis. Um, we've been going out to the Sustainability Commission, Housing um, and Transportation Commissions, as well as planning and zoning, and then um, checking in with city council. And we did that for those two. And as we move forward with the code analysis, I'm sorry, the code concepts, and then the um, the last phase for the final recommendations will be essentially following this same process, um, but with different dates. So um, that's all I have. I do have some other slides. If there's questions, I can show you more, but I'm going to stop there and um, give you all a chance to digest everything I just said to you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions from the commission? You know, uh, not so much questions, uh, just a couple thoughts. Uh, this is a big job that you guys are doing, and it's always important to, to look at codes and other things on a periodic basis uh, because things are appropriate at one time and maybe less appropriate at another time. Uh, I worry about, and, and this topic that we just heard from is a directly related to the Open Space Commission in the sense that uh, there's a code that relates to it that's being adjusted or something like that, or, or even the land use. I worry about several things. The Flagstaff is an unusual city because it's an attractive place to come and live, not necessarily to work, but to come and live. And so this great deal of investment in the city that really doesn't produce housing for the people who live in the city. And increasing the housing doesn't cure that problem. And it also, if you produce a lot of high density, then it causes the uh, lower density houses prices to go up because that's what people tend to want to have. So there's all this involvement that it's really, I, I feel to you guys. The one thing that really popped out on me is that red line, possibly 50% of the usable land couldn't be used because of the re, re, uh, resource protection overlay. And I'll give you an example. Uh, Woodlands Boulevard. And to the west of Woodlands Boulevard was built under the resource protection overlay. And I don't see 50% of that land not being used. So I'm not sure where that number came from. Uh, so that's just an observation, and it's probably out of bounds of the Open Space Commission. But uh, I had the opportunity, so I dropped it. Thank you. 
Thank you for that feedback. Commissioner Norton, do you have your hand up? I do. Um, and, and Michelle and I have talked about this a little bit as, as I followed this through council and through planning and zoning. And, and so I just kind of wanted a little bit of a follow up question with with her, um, with you, Michelle. You know, the last time I had asked, you know, will they get down into the more detailed level of where the specifics of the ownership of those some of those major parcels or, or any of the parcels are really, um, I think, you know, the, the way you have it right now where the state land um, has 2,187 2, acres, but we also know that a lot of it is owned now, or at least has the right to be owned. I mean, I think even since the last time I saw this at the planning and zoning or, or um, council, you know, the Woody Mountain Estates or the Woody Mountain uh, state land was purchased by Roberts communities. And now we know, you know, that, you know, Symmetry has their plans for their state land trust uh, parcel. And yet in these documents, it's still attributed as state land as if we might have some influence on it. And maybe the reality is we weren't going to have as much influence on it as one might hope. So I, I wonder, you know, that has me concerned. And what if they don't upzone? They don't necessarily have to because for some of these estate homes that get built in Flagstaff, it's easy to build on RR and R1. Um, and then there's a lot that's offered, you know, in a planned residential development with, you know, within sort of that catch-all zoning of rural residential that they wouldn't have to rezone. Um, so I don't always know that I would agree that it's a a barrier because there is so much that can be built in those zones without rezoning. Um, and yet I'm also concerned that they won't rezone or they won't build a higher density and we're not gonna have the influence um, on all of this land to get to the housing needs that, that we're trying to get to. So just some thoughts and a question of, you know, are they digging down a little deeper into those larger state land pieces um, and how these owners um, intend to use them and, and what influence we actually will have on this and code that can actually be modified to have influence if, if at all possible. No, thank you for that. And um, I guess, so kind of suggesting the fact that there's been this change. So yeah, I mean, with the last, especially it's a snapshot in time, like, we're not updating it like as people are buying these properties just because it because really it's the 405 and then the, the 500 acres at Woody Mountain that are like the big ones right now because um, we kind of just have to say this is the snapshot in time but to some degree everything you just said kind of shows the importance of why we need to act fast in a way because it is a constantly evolving and changing landscape um, and so to your question about what if they don't want to upzone that's a, that's our fear our fear is that they don't want to, and that's why there's so much emphasis on the process for rezoning of how do we make that a more, um, I don't want to say even expedient, but maybe a more predictable process, right? Like our rezoning process is not predictable because there's usually a development agreement that's associated with it that has a significant amount of negotiations. Um, sometimes it is not predictable and predictability, if something is predictable, you're much more likely to get someone to use that process than something that's unpredictable. Because even if it's a process, if you know what you're gonna encounter, you can put a dollar figure for it and you can build your pro forma. Um, so that's one of the reasons why we're really trying to look at that rezoning process and how do we make it something that people don't fear. Um, and so that's a big part of it. Um, because to your point about the PRD, yes, they can, it gives flexibility, but it only gives flexibility on site design. It doesn't give you any more density. Um, so what it does do that if you have 50 acres that's zoned RR, it allows you maybe to concentrate that development on 10 acres and then preserve the other 40 acres for your open space and other amenities and hopefully have a better design. But it doesn't mean you get more density. Um, so that's I think that will still be a limiting factor on why people may want to upzone. Um, but you've you've definitely articulated the same concerns we have of what if they don't upzone. Um, so 
So yes, we will. And we have been paying attention and working with the, the folks that we know who are, well, except for um, the 500 out at Mountain, we didn't know who would end up with that, but we have encouraged them to come out and talk to us. But definitely with Symmetry is with the 405 acres that they have, that's been um, a consideration. And we're really hoping that they will choose to, to upzone um, the other acreage that's not included in the Pine Canyon expansion. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Can I just make a comment? Um, <clears throat> um, Michelle, this is Sylvia from Open Space. And um, on that map that you showed, I think was two state parcel lands kind of south of Picture Canyon, out towards Walnut Canyon, that are state trust land. And those are on the strategic plan for the Open Space Commission to acquire as open space. Um, and I would also say, similar to what you just mentioned, is that I think that we should work together with housing to purchase those kinds of properties so that we are achieving both goals, that, we're, that we can put some housing there and have some open space at the same time. Sylvia, so, yeah, I think that's a great idea. I mean, and that's actually, that's part of kind of the things that we've been talking about is strategizing with state land. Like even um, work through the region, regional plan process and um, Rebecca has let us know about that. And so we have strategically been working with, well, we can only, we can't identify things as open space on state lands property without their written permission. But what we have been trying to do is work with state land through the regional planning process to identify their lands as higher density because that would then support a rezone if someone did come in and that's half the battle sometimes is just being conformance with the regional plan but to your point we need to go beyond that kind of strategy and think um, much more um, interrelated than that so your points will take and thank you Uh, I have a, two questions about some terminology you use, just, just to clarify. Um, when you say displacement, do you mean that like existing residents get priced out or people of the same economic status can't move in? Like, what do you mean by that? So it, it's the first. It's the people who are in an existing neighborhood who kind of get um, displaced because they can no longer afford the rents in that neighborhood and are being um, kind of priced out of where they live today. Okay. And then you mentioned gentrification and slowing down gentrification. How, how do you define that? How do you measure that? And what do you, how do you, what do you mean by slow down? And so really, um, I shouldn't use the word dis, um, gentrification because really we're talking about displacement and it's part of it is just identifying where it's happening um, and making sure we aren't making code changes um, that are lopsided that would be more favorable in areas that are ex, um, experiencing gentr or displacement. Um, we don't want to make co changes that aren't balanced with code changes, maybe other places, so that now all of a sudden we've made it really desirable to come in and infill in one neighborhood that might already be experiencing that displacement. Um, so that's that's how we're looking at it. Um, your question is a very complicated one as far as, I, I don't think you can stop it, but I think you can hopefully slow it down and we're just trying to slow it down and um, through through different means that we're still kind of working with our consultant team to understand what are best practices and ways that other communities have um, kind of changed their policies and or codes um, and not accelerated it. Sorry, did that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, one last question, just curious. What, what the code analysis piece of this was uh, like short-term rentals in scope, out of scope, where, where does that fall into all of this housing demand and supply issue? So it hasn't really been um, part of the scope. It's definitely been on the radar and part of the conversation, but because we are, as a local government, so limited on how we can regulate it, we don't really have a lot of code. I mean, if anything, that would be the barrier is that we're preempted by the state to regulate short term rental. But no, I mean, and that's about as far as we can go is say that's the barrier. 
Thank you. Uh, any members of the public wish to comment or have a question? Thank you again for uh, your presentation. That was very informative. Yeah, thank you all. And um, Robert is an incredible representative from Open Space. He does not let any of your guys' um, priorities fall off of our radar. So I just have to give him a shout out for that. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Robert, anything else on this? Yeah, so. thanks so much for coming today, Michelle. I really appreciate all your time. Um, and the reason that I requested this item be brought forward, even though it seems a little bit of a tangent from, from the commission, is that I think it does really relate to the open space system and you know, that you guys have in the strategic plan and how it relates, I think, as far as like how open space is distributed throughout the community as far as achieving our 10 minute walking at this time goal and also like. Uh, relates to like open space protection revenue. So I think it might be something for the commission to consider as far as like requesting involvement in this topic to be at least updated as it goes forward and 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 figure out like how we might how it might be important to be involved. So just something I think that and you're referring to the to the uh, uh, Availability and student study, the last part, or, or both? I guess the, the code analysis and how that could, could uh, be affected as far as like plan availability in your study and how that might be related to open space. And I don't actually know all the connections, obviously, Michelle, uh, there's much more person that's yeah. like, much more involved. It might be worth like thinking about. But Michelle, you do know about our desire to have everybody within a 10 or 15 minute walk of open space. Yeah. 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 And so I think to that point, and I'm happy to, to add you guys as a commission to the list that we come in and, and update. We do have a scope, I mean, with our consultant team. So, you know, um, if we, but I think that that scope, I mean, like to the 15 minute um, neighborhoods, like we've even been meeting with, um, Rebecca and Robert and Amy um, Hagen to even talk about like part of like when we look at the resource protection and like how we might do tree resources part of that is looking at kind of how can we create like where people are saving those resources in ways that kind of create um, a different type of um, like a neighbor woods kind of a concept and more um, with more meaningfulness instead of just like the developer kind of squeezing the houses in and trying to figure out where the trees go. I mean, there's a fire safety danger to this, um, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that it's all or nothing. It just means that we can rethink where maybe how we're saving trees and development patterns. So I think like there's areas like that, that there's definitely a lot of overlap to the goals where there is, a, I think, a lot of input that you all could give us and that we could be thinking about how are ways that we do keep again, that community character and keep these things, but also do it in a way that balances out that housing supply. Robert, I think that's maybe kind of what you're thinking, where we have that overlap coming to this group to get over um, input. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but. No, yeah, I think so. that could be Michelle. Uh, that is what I kind of want to think about. <laughs> okay. And yeah, I'm happy to commit to that. I mean, I think when we get to some of these, we really will be in the territory of where we need input from you all. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else for staff on this issue? Oh, right, the same thanks. Thank you. Um, all right, next is the Schultz Creek Open Space Access and Trail Planning Discussion item. Uh, Robert Turner, are you? Yeah, great. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, our colleagues from real estate, Dave and Carmen, have joined us today to give us an update on the Schultz Creek. Uh, you We'll remember that the city has a parcel of about 20 acres that the city council elected to develop some detention basins on. That is zoned as open space and is a connection over to the Forest Service currently. Prior to that, uh, we were working on a trailhead plan for that particular piece of property to help support access to that location. When they built those detention basins, we advocated that there was a staging area on the western side of that property. The public is now using that as a access point up into the Forest Service and also will provide access eventually to our foots and trail system from that point as well. In the 2004 bond 
uh, ordinance, we did identify the neighboring property to the west as a potential acquisition for supporting access to this particular area. And so that is on the list, and our real estate colleagues have been helping us move this along a little bit, and they're going to provide an update on that for the great season. Hi guys, uh, I'm Dave Howe. I'm with the real estate division. I've been here for uh, just a couple of months now, and this is one of the projects uh, they gave me when I got on board here. And so I want to just kind of show you guys, um, and you probably already know this, what it looked like before and uh, what it look like, looks like now. So let me share my screen with you here. Everybody see this one here? Am I showing it properly? Looks good. Okay. So everybody recognizes this right here. Um, this was the wash uh, basin that was put in. Uh, this is what it looked like before. Okay. And as you can see, uh, Dr. Christensen owns this parcel of land right here. And the public was using the bottom portion of this for parking and access and whatnot to the trail. And fast forward to now, and we're kind of still using it as access. Uh, and this down here is needed from Dr. Christensen. So the idea we came up with was there's an access road right here. It's an easement that goes up to a water uh, valve right in here. And we're going to keep we're going to get from him from this portion all the way down and in exchange we're going to give him a piece of open space which this whole section here is open space we're going to give him a piece that goes from here and comes right up around here like that so that way his whole parcel will be this whole piece up here and then we'll be able to retain everything down low down here um i felt it was important to let the open space commission know that we're actually going to do this and um, uh, it's going to it's going to help the public and serve better access. And Mr. Sh uh, Dr. Schultz has been or Dr. Christensen, I'm sorry, has been uh, very cooperative over the years of letting everybody be on his land down here. Uh, so it's time we make a move and make things right and give him this piece and we'll take the piece down here. So that's kind of where we're at on that. Does anybody have any any questions if anybody's not familiar with this? Uh, I you showed the piece that he, that Dr. Christensen would see, but you just did it in a hand waving way. Uh, the reason I'm asking maybe for a little more definitive okay. line there is because I'll show you. Okay, I can show you. I can show you some legal descriptions here if this will help out a little bit. This piece here is the piece that Dr. Christensen will retain. And then from this border here on down is the part that the city will receive. And the, and reason the reason I'm asking is right along the eastern border of that and very close to it, um, there's a natural uh, trail there's a location for a net there is already a trail there but it's it's in a location that is is perfect and does not require folks to go along the dikes uh, which i think will be a, a problem to maintain over a period of time uh, people are familiar with it, what's there is the dirt is laid on top of the rock uh, it provides the uh, dikes there. Yeah, so that 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 trail that you're talking about, yeah. it will cut into the 20 acres that the city's going to get them from. It is currently on open space, but it will go on. It would the, the the benefits of that trail are you don't actually have to cross the Schultz Creek drainage. You stay above it the whole time. Exactly. But I'm not sure that anybody really cares about that as much as us. The trail is in the drainage area. No, it's up on the left-hand side. It's on the slope. It's not in the drainage area. 
it's it's a it's a good trail. It's in it's in on open space, but it is on piece. It, but it's homemade. People just made it because it's a good place to put it. But it is on the piece of land that will go. It's right here. So there's there's the drainage, right? And this route is uh, people are coming up here and they're riding their bikes right like here. this. Yeah. And they're staying above the drainage system, so you can get over. I mean, the other way to get there is you drive to the Forest Service parking lot, and park a car there, and then you go from there. So it's not like you have to. You're but yeah, to... the piece that they're talking about trading is right here. So that route would be lost. Pardon. Um, is anything like people coming to the bit on this week? Yeah, uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, just a little bit of context on on that trail, and I'm I'm gonna uh, share my screen for a moment. If that's all right. So that there you can see the um, kind of the a recent aerial, uh, along with the parcels to be traded to the city and from the city. And when the when the detention basins were nearing completion, uh, Robert and Open Space and Pros and and um, we reached out to the Forest Service to see about getting that trail connected because we knew that when the construction was done and that parking lot was in place, that users would start using that parking lot and would need to connect to the Forest Service trails. And if we didn't provide a way for them to do that, uh, they, they would find their own way. Um, so in, in fairly short order, uh, Robert and the Forest Service got a trail established, uh, which is the official one that you see now that kind of goes along the top of the of the berm. Uh, the Forest Service wanted that alignment to be uh, along the top of the berm. We talked about the another alignment to the west of the detention basin along the kind of where the social trail goes now that, that you've been talking about. And they, they did not want that trail, the official trail anyway, to be located um, along that alignment. Uh, we've checked with them again because if uh, if I think your concern is that if we trade this parcel, then we lose that opportunity to make that trail connection on that side of the detention basins. And we've had conversation with the Forest Service. We can check with them again to see if to, just to verify that that is not their preferred location, that they would rather keep it on top of that berm. Uh, but that but that's kind of the direction that we're getting from them. And and we have given them them. Uh, some autonomy in making that decision because it's it's to their for uh, their trail system that this connects. Um, so we let them have a little bit of judgment in making that call. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the reality. I mean, it's not it's not a designated route, and we, it won't be there. It'll be on private land, and I suspect that the owner will move his fence over there and fence it off because people will just keep using it. I'm, I'm not sure why I understand why the Forest Service would be against it, other than there's something above the blue and green boundary there on the, on the north end that persuades them that it's not a good idea. But from the long term, uh, if that trade goes through, there'll probably be expansion of parking. The future of that area is more and more and more use. And I think the trail system along the dike is, is really not a long-term functional trail. Uh, if two bikes pass on that trail and one loses its balance, go right down on that rip rock. And in other words, it's a very dangerous route. And so I am really uh, concerned that we block off any potential alternate route from that parking area. And I see that parking area expanding. I've counted 100 cars and what's there now. And I could see much more of when this land becoming available. I'm, I'm wondering if, you know, maybe 20 feet or something along the north-south green line of the prisons of the proposed trade land could be set aside as a potential future trail or something like that. Uh, again, I can't say that any more 
seriously that the trail that exists now is very, very dangerous. The one over that, the run over the dike sites. Yeah. Well, depending on the erosion, it's about three to four feet wide. And on either side, there's a slope of almost 25 degrees of just jagged rocks. And if you put a fence up along there, then two-way traffic would be very, very difficult. So I see that as only a temporary solution. I said. I think the reason the Forest Service didn't want it going that way is because at the top of that drainage is what comes down from the mountain. So you have at the end of that trail, you've got to cross over. Now that's to cross over a spring or the or the drainage or something. There's a water. There's water there. You can make a sharp left. Yeah, if you make a sharp left, yeah. The way they rerouted it, the way they rerouted the water, it does stay more to the right and the trail goes to the left. And you have a good point. And has this deal been agreed to? We've been working on it. Yeah, we've been working on no. it. I mean, yeah, the, we haven't finalized the deal yet. The expanded parking lot is absolutely necessary. And it, it's really sensible to have it under city management. And it could be done. I, I love what you all have done already. And, you know, People are not parking underneath the trees and compacting the soil, but they're getting shade and, you know, we'll just deal with all that. And the water body keep in is great too. I think, uh, I think now I, under, I really understand where Nat White's position is because as a pretty regular user up there too, it is nice not to cross the, that trail is excellent. The, the, the user created trail, which I know I can understand the Forest Service might not want, and I respect that. Martin, you've given the Forest Service sort of leverage on deciding what goes on. And it may have been, you know, it could be a liability for the city as well, having a trail that the user have created versus one that goes over the dike. I don't know which one the liability would be ever bring on, but it's certain. I mean, I think that's why a concern of maybe a buffer along that eastern edge of the trade, you know, maybe just be a part of the conversation. I don't know. I, I'm not an expert in this, and you all are, but Nat is really speaking. He's speaking for a lot of people. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to. Martin, go ahead. I would, I would, we we can we can certainly reach out to uh, our contacts at the Forest Service and have a meeting with them and kind of e express those concerns and just just make sure one last time before uh, we finalize the uh, this trade that that we're happy with that with that trailer if we want to if we want to keep reserve an easement for it because now of course is the time to do it. Yeah, yeah. Agreed. We can we'll set up we'll set up that meeting and and talk to the Forest Service. I mean, I think if there was public input, that is a lot of public input that you would get on that. Thank you. Something else to keep in mind uh, is that we're trying to keep the parcels we're trading and receiving close to the same acreage. That way it's an even apples to apples swap, but there may have to be money involved um, on our parcel we're receiving. It's encumbered by a lot of uh, of the roadway. The easement from the roadway and the only easement that will be on the parcel we're giving to christensen is a water line easement um and so that that'll be it so we were just trying to stay within the same same size mary yeah understood on that i would just suggest though that the top portion that's outlined with that easement down to I think with some of that land that the city's getting, it would not be necessarily beneficial as far as parking or anything else on the top portion of that slender piece there. Yeah, in that area there. Uh, so yeah, and we kind of chose we chose that angle that that road right the angle right there we chose that because there's a road a current easement road that goes up to that water box and so that was kind of like we, reason why we chose that 
that it's, middle divider right there. Understood, but it's where your where your end was just a minute ago is a horizontal line near the east west line. Uh, yeah, just a little bit below that. Uh, yeah, I think that's if, if that was the barrier, uh, the top of of the uh, the cars that were blown that this kept the city kept. You kept the right way just to get to that valve and gave Mr. Christensen or traded Mr. Christensen that portion and took a little bit off the other portion. Uh, all I'm saying is it seems to me that there's some geometry that could be flexed that would benefit everybody. Just just a thought. Maybe that Mary? yeah, I, I I just wanted to throw a, a comment out there and just uh, I support Nat's comment. I, I remember when we went out there on our field trip as a commission and walked over the uh, the drainage areas. I've been out there since, and and everybody I've ever been with, and even our group when we were there, we all kind of went, oh wow, okay, this is the trail. Um, concern for kids riding, um, erosion, et cetera. So I think if there is a solution for an additional trail that doesn't go over this, um, the detention basins. I just wanted to throw my support toward that. Thank you. I mean, it might just be worth getting a GIS map, GIS route of that trail and plopping it on there and see maybe it's, maybe it is all on state and it's city. It's, it's very close to that green line, that's for sure. And Martin, you know what we're talking about. So. I do. Does it drop down right on this? Does it stay on city or does it go on to that into that potential trade piece? Uh, that that part, I, I don't know for sure. I, I, I would imagine it's got to be um, just it's because right. of the just based on this aerial that it's got to be a, at least a part on that potential trade piece. Yeah, that top right corner. Yeah, there's just there's not much boundary here it's got to i think it's got to be like right about on that boundary anything else from that commission and members of the public thank you staff are on this issue before we go Thank you all for taking the time to uh, discuss that. Uh, we're moving now to the reports and updates part of the agenda. And the first item is a council representative report from council member Harris. She's with us. Okay. Noted. Uh, and Commissioner Norton, planning and zoning commission representative report. I don't have anything for this evening. Thanks. Great. Uh, the next item is the open space management report. Robert and Sylvia. Yeah, Sylvia, do you want to? Sure. Um, so the newsletter, the pros newsletter was included um, in the materials. Um, people asked about it earlier. So the full moon hike that we had at Mars Hill Trail had 50 people ooh, that came to it. Um, and and they all enjoyed it. And Ashley um, Flinney is our new open space educator. Yay. Yay. Um, and so that was her first day. <laughs> um, and everybody that hiked with her said, we made a good choice and I agree with her. So, um, so she's kind of hit the ground running with um, taking kids out on field trips starting Thursday. Um, we have our next, um, we have a couple more invasive weed pulls, which are after work. If you'd like to join us, September 4th and September 18th from 5 to 7.30 p.m. at Picture Canyon. Um, we finished up our invasive weed workshops and weed pulls kind of around town um, last week. And um, our next full moon hike is at Picture Canyon on September 17th. 6.15 p.m. We'll hike the inner leaf, not the Don Weaver Trail. 
Thanks. Um, I had a couple items as well. I know you guys heard a while ago that uh, City Council updated the BBB fund ordinance to include open space, so we're super excited about that. Uh, and now, um, BBB tax is going to uh, flourish in November. Uh, so I sent out a little bit of information about that, and then Rebecca next month will come to the commission to discuss the BBB fund. So if you have questions, other things, um, yeah. You can think about that. And then um, we are working on trying to get on a city council agenda for the 17th of September for the next steps for the proposed amendment through the through Curry Mesa natural area to private property holders on that east side uh, for direction from city council. So that would be a general direction from city council, likely a vote. Um, to move it to the next steps, which would involve a state review for that process. Is anybody familiar with that? Yeah. That's, that's the yes. connection from Pinhal Road oh, okay. uh, through Section 6 yeah. to a series of private you know, parcels on the east side of Section 6. Yeah. Um, and uh, the property owners have been. Uh, wanting to hopefully their easement to allow that connection. So that goes to the city council, but then this, then it also goes to the state parks. Mm -hmm. And what's the audit? So the city council uh, decision, is, uh, I think it's not a formal decision. The property owners asked essentially that we take it to city council to see if we have general approval before they spend a lot of money on developing a like final concept plan for that where they're working out the details. And so we did a presentation to the city council that included the commission's recommendation on that topic. Uh, and that was a informational update to them. And then we were coming back to after the decision on that item. The decision being like, is this something that you would consider if the state park system approved it? So then it would go to state parks okay. for their review process and the same sort of presentation office would also have to be involved. It's, um, it, it would be altering the easement onto the conservation easement property. Uh, and, and this would be done after the community up there has paid for a plan. No, I think the, the I, we have asked the state parks what they would need. Okay. They would need like a legal description of the plan, but they don't, from my understanding, they don't need a final concept from the property owner. They would go through the review process with the current concept. Okay. And then they would go back, they would come back. If they approved, they give a yes vote, uh, the state park, state park board, and the, the state historic SHPO approved the project. Then the project would come back to the city for their development process. So I think it would go to planning and zoning uh, before going back to city council for a uh, whole. And then the community is on the dollar for the thing for the plan. So, so all these things happen in the fourth property and there's paper plan. Yeah, I think. I yeah, so it would first go to state parks and then come coming back to the city, it would have to go through the formal development process. So they'd have to develop a final process. That's my understanding. Hope oh, they have that right. And, and the state park board, when they meet on this, uh, will there be property owners there to state their case? And will there be a city person to state the case, or is it just passing information and they just look at the information? Uh, state Parks was requested, depending on the council's direction, obviously, uh, in September, um, for us to provide them with information from the commission and from the city council discussions. And then, of course, the private property owners have to provide the information that they're, they've requested from them. And then we have offered to like, help provide a presentation to the board. Uh, they have not given us an indication of their committee on that or not. Um, but the property owners, the private property owners will also be notified, and I believe we'll have the option of attending 
Yeah, that means it's four. Robert, to clarify, that's September 17th. You said November 17th. Oh, did I? Got it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm working on trying to. I don't. I don't have it firmed up on the agenda yet. But September 17th is the city council date that we are currently shooting. Uh, uh, so I've got a little work on that to do. And then, <clears throat> so any other thoughts or questions on that? And then the other item that I wanted to bring to your attention again was that we do have the downtown library community room reserved for the 19th of December or September. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that is the public meeting for the Observatory Mesa Trail, and as you all approved for that for the next stage. It's uh, September, 19th. September 19th. And I know some of you emailed me at City Hall uh, about uh, that's at the downtown library. library. Oh, oh, yes. Yeah. 5 so 7 p.m. We are working on getting our outreach kicked off for that this week, and uh, we will have everything lined up. Um, for that public meeting, um, and we'll see what type of direction we get from. Well, that will include a survey and some survey questions at the meeting as well. So we'll see what kind of feedback. Yeah. And one of the things that I just uh, I hate to stop the agenda offer, right? But I wouldn't mind even seeing the plan one more time. Okay. Thoughts. I don't want to go into this whole big thing. I know it's a big deal. Just throwing it out there. Um, we can get that under potential future agenda items here. Two things. We're almost there. Okay. <laughs> Anything else from I think that's, okay. that's all I've got for the uh, group or something. Yeah. Uh, the next agenda item is the proposed monthly newsletter. Sylvia mentioned that. Is there anything? More to discuss about that? I think so. Yeah. We said about the FAQ next. You have some questions about it. So. Okay. Uh, information, informational items to and from commissioners and staff. Anything fall in that category? I just want to share that several council members came up to me and said that the commission did a great job in providing information on this uh, section six, the right away that we were just talking about. And really appreciated the work we put into it. Apparently, they looked at a lot of the discussion of the documents, at least two of them. Awesome. Anything from staff? Okay, uh, potential future agenda items. We already had one. Yes, that's okay. potential future agenda items. I, I just don't want it to take a long time, but. I'd like to show. Okay. Is that something that we need to vote on to include it on the agenda, or do we disagree? Um, uh, let me just ask for a little bit of clarification. So, I think our plan for carrying the through information trail plan to the next step was to do a public meeting, and then initially we had thought about like summarizing that data from the meeting. And going directly to city council with that, with those findings for an informational update, and then eventually a plan adoption. We have uh, heard a, a number of like input from the community, and, and so I thought about providing some survey questions to the community and seeing like what kind of feedback we get, mm -hmm. and then I could provide that update to the commission. Um, so I think, though, if we didn't get a lot of concern from the community about the plan that the, the commission has like recommended to be carried forward, that we just like continue on um, the next step, which would be go to city council. If we did get a lot of like feedback and a lot of concern from the community, we could write that to the open space commission. I think that's what I was the tentative thought for carrying it forward to the next step would be, but I'm open to any. Ideas the commission can ask for. So that's the one that you will have it, the public um, survey or comment or whatever on the 90th, right? You collected that there? 
or but also as well there'll be an online community online. survey okay. yeah so the public meetings the 19th of september we're trying to meet and there's a survey associated with that which will be about approximately 40 day survey that we've had, we had two surveys already um, so we're getting the, I, I think we're experiencing a little bit of like community fatigue on the topic so we're going to keep the questions fairly basic as we record like maybe four or five questions about like how does the plan look to you you know like do you guys feel comfortable moving the plan forward city council that sort of thing and we have some specific topics we've been getting a lot of feedback from the community on mostly biking right mostly the bike alignments that were brought up at the last meeting by some representatives of FBO. and so i do anticipate that we might get some feedback from the community on those topics survey. If we're getting a lot of feedback, I think it might be appropriate for the commission to, to take a look at it again before we go to city council. And, and the reason that I suggested is I think it might be wise for us to have a plan that one, of course, is meets the needs of the community, but has been like we try to iron out as much as we can before we take this council so we don't end up like with a ton of like negative feedback and such. I think that's well I think yeah. I like that approach. You thought it through I mean like we we don't go to city council so like I really appreciate your like this is the most effective way to do this and I just don't want it to get to city council and all of a sudden the whole general public is out there and like they didn't listen to us, you know. I just that's the part I want to avoid. I want to have a plan that we present that did listen to people. That's I'm guessing that's what you're trying to make sure happens as well. Yeah, I mean I think the public process has been pretty robust. Uh, I mean we've gotten a lot of comments. I realize that the number of comments that we've gotten will call a small compared to the population of the case stuff, right? We had that kind of discussion. Uh, but I think it's important that we we gauge the public reason a little bit more. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I hate to like um, <clears throat> keep rehashing the same topic, but uh, I think we've got a really good plan. I really do. I think we've got a good plan. We've worked out a lot of uh, issues for the community. I think we've made a huge effort for finding my like, middle ground. And I think the plan is a good one. So I, I think we just see like how, how the community receives it. Uh, our, let me take a look and see like the approximate dates for the, the survey. Hold on. Uh, my thoughts I think are, if we get a ton of comments that seem unresolved, then we can bring it back to the commission and explain our findings and make a recommendation. And that would be like at the September meeting? Or no, just that, like and that's what I want to find out. I think the survey would still technically be open in that meeting. Okay. I think technically we, and if, if we want to have, we wanted to reduce it to a 30 day, we might be able to meet that, but I think if we wanted to continue to have that 40 day public comment period, that that would end until uh, the first or so week of October. That would give us a little bit of time to like have it day like that and bring it back in October if we thought it needed to be. My, my concern with the surveys and even the 19th meeting is that we address what several people, mostly Duffy, have brought up, that there are a lot of people that live around the uh, uh, natural area, territory based natural area, uh, that don't feel like they're being contacted directly. And with zoning changes, there's a perimeter around that area that the city really sends letters to and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I'm not saying they should be treated any differently, but they do feel like they haven't been addressed. And for surveys in particular, I don't know how you do it, but if you just 
test for input. And they're a group like the biking group, or it could be the running group, or it could be the equestrian group, or whatever. Uh, they're the ones that will be, their antennas will be up, and they'll be the ones that put the input in. And I keep saying, we bought this as a community. And we bought it through the Arizona Conservative Initiative, which has its framework for this form. And so the community should have the input in these surveys. And I don't know how you can do a survey and not have it skewed by people that are really interested in it. The other side of the coin is, well, they're not interested in it, so be it. Let the people that are interested to decide. But I just can't, I can't justify that. So I don't know. Yeah, and rest assured, we, we hear you, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, we we have done our best to like get the word out as sure. well as possible, like through different yeah. venues or or like posters mm -hmm. and like, yeah. like, social media marketing yeah. and or community calendars, things like that. We had added one form of outreach for this uh wave of like, outreach we did in the past, and that is mayors. So we do we did set a boundary of I don't know, a thousand feet or something like that of around which we're permission. Do plan to send a postcard to everybody that's within a thousand feet, so that hopefully will meet those immediate neighborhoods there. I, I'd say a quarter of a mile. Yeah, I can't walk. remember how big it is, but uh, it stands. Well, I mean, right. yeah. We need to send those out like this week if that's going to arrive in time for our meeting. Um, so we do have the postcard drafted and everything, pretty much ready to go. Yeah. Well, that's good. That's that's an effort. Yeah, a five thousand divided by it's close to a quarter mile. I mean, it's shy, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, in terms of a, a future potential agenda item, we're going to await the results of the survey. If the input is such that we have to reconsider the plan, we will vote in September. Put it on the October meeting schedule. That does summarize that correctly. Yeah, I think we'll have an indication of what the survey is sharing with us and what what can back we're getting back from the public in September. But the survey won't have to close until the first part of October. And so I'm thinking like if we need to put it on the agenda, you know. Okay. Great. So I can review. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh any other potential future agenda items? Uh, All right. The other items that I have, sorry, oh, no, go ahead. Uh, was the BBB tax renewal for September. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to have this ready, um, but I do have project prioritization and multi year project planning, and that's uh, in tandem with the BBB funds, right? So the Parks and Recreation Commission, they built a five year plan based on the BBB fund allocations that they're getting. I think I'm going to go for to have input on that same sort of topic. So I'd love to start the discussion, if not September and October. Yes. Um, and then in October, uh, they've been working on the Vice South Regional Plan 2025, and they'd like to come and provide a presentation to the this commission. This particular topic, I think, is pretty important. Though. It's basically yeah. city area, yeah. it's land use, and the I think it's fair to say the focus of the regional plan is like have been climate change and housing. And I think it's important for the commission to think about the range that is included for open space, especially as it pertains to the last plan as well. That will be not the Awesome. Great. Thank you. All right, that brings us to adjournment. Is there a motion to adjourn? So Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you all. Good job. Four on, well everybody. Six o'clock. Nice. Four minutes spare. <laughs>